This morning's sermon is titled, If You Can't Stand the Heat, and I think there's some of us perhaps old enough here who can complete that sentence, because it is just a portion of a sentence. If you can complete it, say it with me. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. That's right, yes. <clears throat> now, uh, what you may not know, though, is that Harry Truman said that, former president of the United States of America, and he wasn't talking about cooking. And he wasn't talking about the hottest place in the house. He was talking about leadership. And so in the context of leadership, Harry Truman said, if you can't stand the heat, then you better stay out of the kitchen. Now, I don't believe he was saying that leaders should be ready to quit when the going gets tough. I think, in fact, he was saying just exactly the opposite. I, was, I think he was saying, if you're a leader of any uh, stretch of the imagination, you simply need to be prepared for the fact that you're going to experience some opposition. Somebody's going to try and turn up the heat on you uh, if you're a leader. We're in the midst of a series of sermons in the book of Nehemiah. That series is titled, Be Determined, and it's based upon Warren Wiersbe's work on that particular book of the Bible, Nehemiah. And uh, this particular chapter we're looking at here today is chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to chapter 6 of Nehemiah as we look at this particular passage of Scripture. You know, not only do we understand what Harry Truman was saying, uh, that it applies to leaders in general, but, you know, it does apply to Christian leaders as well. And this chapter 6 is going to bear that out very clearly. We're going to see very clearly how the opponents of Nehemiah tried to turn up the heat on him to get him out of the situation and out of the way so that the building of the walls can stop. But we would also say that Regardless if you're a Christian leader, like we might consider that to be a deacon or a pastor or a chairman of a committee or something like that, we understand that any type of leadership, any type of moving forward with God's agenda, you're liable to experience opposition or opponents. You, you know, folks, it's, it's really true, and you, you know this to be true, that if you're a committed believer in Jesus Christ and you're truly trying to further God's kingdom, you're truly trying to live a life that glorifies Jesus Christ, you're going to run into some obstacles. Amen? It's just going to happen. It comes with the territory. So the idea here is not that we should try and figure out a way to live our lives where we don't run into those obstacles. That's not going to happen. You're going to have obstacles. The, the, the object here is to know how to deal with them when they come our way. And we're going to allow Nehemiah to show us exactly how to do that. Now, let's review what we've seen here so far in the book of Nehemiah, chapters 1 through 5. Nehemiah, living in Persia, has responded to God's call to go to Jerusalem, to help his people rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, put the gates back in place, and to become God's people once again. And this is a very important step in Israel's history that culminates in the coming of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. So this is very important. And Nehemiah has responded to the call. He's gone to Jerusalem. He has gathered the people together. He has said, you see how horrible the conditions are that we're living in? Let's rebuild the walls. And to their credit, the people said, yes, let's rebuild the walls. But you know and you saw it just as soon as they started rebuilding the walls, the opposition started, didn't it? And people on the outside, Samballat and Tobiah and the Ammonites and, the, and Geshem and the Arabs and all that, they gathered together and they gave a show of force, clearly indicating their opposition to the building of the walls of Jerusalem. Yet Nehemiah and the people, they dealt with that opposition, they protected themselves, and the work on the wall continued. But just as soon as they dealt with that threat, they realized there was a threat within, selfishness. And selfishness amongst God's people inside the walls of Jerusalem was deteriorating their morale and keeping them from building the, the wall as effectively as they should. And so they dealt with the enemy within, selfishness. But now, here again, we see opposition coming to Nehemiah from the enemies on the outside, but they've changed their tactic. Now they are targeting Nehemiah himself. They have the understanding that if we can just get Nehemiah out of the way, if we can discredit him or remove him from the situation, then the walls will stop being built and we'll get what we want. And obviously the enemies didn't want the wall to be built because they saw that as a threat to their power, to their ability to do the things that they wanted to do. And so they were trying to stop the walls from being built, and they realized that Nehemiah perhaps was the key. And so they've targeted Nehemiah now here in chapter 6. Now, Nehemiah knew something that <clears throat> Paul wrote about hundreds of years later. Even though Nehemiah lived long before Paul ever showed up, he knew 
what Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 11. Just listen to this. This is where Paul says, We will not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his intentions. Did you hear that last part? He said, we are not ignorant of Satan's intentions. In other words, we know what the enemy is trying to do. But he also says, we're not going to allow what the enemy wants to do to impact us, to get us to the, to the degree that we are not doing what God wants us to do. We will not be taken advantage of, he says. What, what the enemy is proposing to do, we are not going to allow that to deter us from the great work that God has called them to do. Nehemiah knew that to be true in his day and time as well. Even though he experienced opposition on a personal level, he said, I'm not going to allow that to deter me. I'm going to be determined to do what God has called me to do. And folks, that's the same kind of determination that you and I will need as we seek to serve God, as we seek to build his kingdom, he, even here in this community, even here as a corporate body of the church of First Baptist Church, Ray City. And that leads us to say the main thing. If you're using your bulletin for taking notes, you see on the front there's the main thing. We're going to put it up here on the screen. Here's the main thing, folks. Believers must say no to anything that hinders the advancement of God's kingdom. Nehemiah did that, and that's exactly the right thing to do. Now, folks, I want to make sure that we understand something here. There's a danger here, and the danger is misapplying what's up here on the board. The key word there, or words, is God's kingdom. In other words, when we are convinced that we're moving in the direction that God wants us to go, then we need to be committed to that direction no matter what. The danger is for me to come up with my own idea and think that's God's will. Is everybody with me? There's a real danger in, in us saying, well, I've come up with this great idea, and since I'm a Christian and I've come up with it, it must be God's will. Well, uh, hold on to your seats, but I'm going to tell you something. That's not necessarily true. The danger here is to supplant God's will with my own desires and then say, so I'm going to say no to anybody and everybody that tries to convince me anything different. Well, folks, there's a real danger there. If we're brothers and sisters in Christ, we're supposed to help one another move along the path of God's will. And if there's anything that's keeping you from doing that, I have a responsibility to help you see what God's will truly is. So we have to be convinced that we're moving in the direction that God wants us to, in the advancement of his kingdom. And if we're convinced of that, if we know that we're doing exactly what God wants us to do, then we have the freedom and we have the, uh, the responsibility to say no to anything that deters us from building God's kingdom. We need to have that kind of determination. Now here in chapter 6, we're going to see four different ways that the enemy tries to turn up the heat on Nehemiah to discredit him, to get him out of the way. We're going to see that, but also see how Nehemiah responds to that. And let this be a way of us being prepared, because as we said at the very beginning, as believers, the choice is not to find a way to live to avoid the obstacles. The obstacles are coming our way. If you're trying to build the kingdom, Satan is going to try and put obstacles in the way. Our goal is to find out how to deal with them when they come. So let's look here at how the enemy tries to turn up the heat on Nehemiah. First of all, they use the heat of compromise, the heat of compromise. If you've got your Bibles open to chapter 6, well, let's look at verses 1 through 4 here. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it, though at that time I had not installed the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. But they were planning harm to me. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal, and I gave them the same reply. Now, folks, this sounds innocent enough. Here's Sanballat and Geshem and Tobiah, and they haven't been getting along with uh, Nehemiah up to this point, but they're saying, hey, let's bury the hatchet. Let's get together in a neutral point. Let's just kind of talk about some things. Let's see if we can work some things out. Let's find some middle ground here. Sounds innocent enough, but as we will see as the story unfolds, their motives were not pure. They did not have Nehemiah or the people of Jerusalem's interest at heart. They had their own selfish interest at heart. 
But they were trying to do uh, something here, uh, and we were going to use the word compromise. They were trying to compromise this whole situation by inviting Nehemiah to leave and to go meet with them there at the villages of Ono. And I think I, I love the fact that the, that the name of the place they were going was Ono, because when temptation comes, what you, should you say? Oh, no. <laughs> and I, I, I love that. So that's exactly what Nehemiah did. And he said no to this request of his enemies to meet with him uh, to, to find common ground. He responded, no, I will not do that. And he did it based on three convictions. Now, I want to hammer that word conviction here, folks. And, and let's use it in this sense. When we say he said no according to his convictions, in other words, he said no because he was convinced of some things that were true, okay? And, and the three things that led him to say no to each request was, first of all, you heard him say it, they were planning to harm me. It was right there at the very end of verse 2. Now, we don't know how he came to that realization, but he came to the conclusion that they were trying to get him out of the city, into that area, and they were going to harm him. And so that was one of the reasons that he said no. But he also said no because, as you see there in verse 3, he says, I'm doing a great work and cannot come down. In other words, he's saying the work is too important. Why should I stop the work? Now, they've already stopped the work previously because of the selfishness that was, uh, they had to deal with previous in, the, in the previous chapter. Now they're saying, lose some more time. Nehemiah says, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I can't, I'm not going to stop the work just to come see you folks. And then finally, and, and it's just implied, but we're going to see it more clearly in just a moment. Look at the very end of verse 3. He says, why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Now, let's focus on that you word. Who is he speaking of? Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem. Who were they? The enemies. But also, stay right here. Keep your finger in chapter 6, but go back to chapter 2 real quick, okay? Chapter 2, verse 20. You remember in chapter 2, that's when Tobias and, uh, uh, Tobiah and Sanballat and Geshem had been criticizing Sanba or, uh, Nehemiah and the people for building all of this. And listen to the reply that, that Nehemiah gives to them. Verse 20 of chapter 2, I gave them this reply, the God of heaven is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building, but now listen to this, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. What was he saying to them? You folks, Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, you're not part of this project. You're not the Jews who are going to live here in Jerusalem. You're on the outside. Why should I then come to you and talk about this project? So Nehemiah said, no, I'm not going to compromise. And, folks, it's because he came to the realization that to do so would violate his convictions. Now, folks, I hope you hear this. It is always a sin when we compromise the truth. Amen or oh me? It is a sin when we compromise the truth, when we violate the truth, when we twist it and mold it and shape it to our own desires or our own uh, uh, agendas. Now, I recognize that there are some of us who are saying, but Brother Robbie, isn't, I mean, isn't compromise a good thing? I mean, don't, don't most of us compromise most of our lives trying to find middle ground and just get along with folks? Listen, compromise is fine when it brings like-minded people together and they find beneficial common ground between the two of them and it does not violate morality or issues of truth. But when compromise violates morality or truth and it twists it and changes it, it is not compromise, it is sin. Folks, there was a, a businessman, a rich businessman up in New York, and he decided that he was going to get into the cattle raising business. So he bought himself a farm out in Texas and bought him some cattle and just set up a ranch out there. And he went out there to live and he'd been out there for six months. And some friends of his from New York wanted to see how his new enterprise was going. So they came to visit him and they got there and he was showing them the ranch. And they said, well, what's the name of your ranch here? He said, well, he said, I wanted to call it the Bar J, but my wife wanted to call it the Susie Q. And my son wanted to call it the Flying W, and my daughter wanted to call it the Lazy Y. And we couldn't agree on a name, so we compromised. So the name of the ranch is the Bar J Susie Q Flying W Lazy Y. And they were impressed by that. And they looked around, though, and they said, well, where's your cattle? And he said, none of them survived the branding. Now, that was compromise, but it wasn't good, was it? 
Now, let's get a little bit more serious. If you've been a believer for any length of time, the enemy has come along and has tried to get you to compromise your convictions. Whether it's sitting around at the break table at work and a co-worker tells a dirty joke, or it's someone who is a friend of yours suggesting that you all enter into a course of behavior that you know violates God's word, or it's whether temptation has come along for you to do something that you know will damage your marriage, but you want it simply because you want it. Folks, that's all ways in which the enemy is trying to compromise your convictions. And listen again, what did we say earlier? Any time that we compromise the truth, it's a sin. Nehemiah said, oh no. I will not compromise what I believe to be true, and I will not compromise God's work. And folks, he didn't refuse at one time. You saw it there. Look at it again. Verse 4, four times they sent me the same proposal. And this is a small detail, but let me just say it. Folks, if it's wrong the first time, it's wrong the fourth time. We're going to find out it was actually five here in a moment. Folks, in our day and time, how do we apply this? When the temptation comes for us to compromise what we believe to be true about God and what his word tells us, we need to say no to that. Because it will deter us from the path of following God along his will and way for us as people. Now, they also tried to turn up the heat of gossip. Look at verses 5 through 9. Sanballat sent me this same message a fifth time by his aide, who had an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem agrees, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you are building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf, there is a king in Judah. Now these rumors will be heard by the king. So come, let's confer together. Then I replied to him, there is nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You are inventing them in your own mind. For they were all, they were all trying to intimidate us, saying they will become discouraged in the work and it will never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen me. Folks, you see what was taking place there. This uh, aide, this messenger shows up a fifth time asking San, uh, Nehemiah to come to have this meeting of compromise. But also he then carries this time an open letter. And in that open letter are lies about Nehemiah. That he's doing all this to set himself up as king. That he's arranged the prophets to proclaim him king. That all of this is about Nehemiah. Now, folks, an open letter back in that day and time, very different from a closed letter. A closed letter was only to be opened and read by the person that it was addressed to. But an, uh, that, that was a closed letter. But an open letter, that, could, that information could be made available to anybody. And so you see what they were doing. They were spreading this idea that Nehemiah's motives were not pure. He was doing this for his own benefit. So they were using gossip and rumors and lies to try and discredit Nehemiah. At the very least, even if the king in Persia did not hear, which is what worked the first time when Ezra tried to rebuild the walls, even if that didn't happen, the people would be divided about Nehemiah and his intent. Now, folks, let me just simply say to you that, and you know this, gossip is a very serious thing. Uh, folks, I, I can tell you personally that I have witnessed the, the destruction of an individual church's ability to minister and witness in a community because of one simple thing, gossip. I've seen it firsthand. I, I, I've experienced it. When people are willing to embrace that which is not true without finding out whether or not it's true or not, and they just spread that kind of thing along, they are in participation with one of Satan's most diabolical schemes he's got. Because gossip can damage people to the extent where there is no reparation. There is no repair. You've heard the old uh, story of the, the person who had the problem with gossip. I know you've heard this story. And the, the preacher said, listen, I need you to do something for me. He grabbed a pillow out of his study and they walked out on the church grounds. And, and he said to this person, he said, cut open this pillow and spread out all the feathers out here on the church parking lot. 
And the fella did that, and, and then the preacher said, now come back next week, uh, 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 tomorrow at the same time. They came back together at the same time there in the church parking lot, and the pastor said, now, now go pick up all the feathers that you scattered yesterday. And the fella said, well, there's no way in the world I can pick up all those feathers. I mean, they're everywhere now. The wind is blowing them around for 24 hours. And the pastor said, yeah, that's exactly right, and that's what gossip is. You can't go get it back. You can't undo the damage. But that's what they were trying to use, and they were very clever because it's a very effective tool to damage someone. And they were trying to do that towards Nehemiah, to say that he was uh, doing this for his own motives. And really what they were hoping is that Nehemiah would spend time trying to repair his own reputation instead of repairing the walls. But Nehemiah saw through that. And he continued to work. I want you to notice here, in verse 8, he replied one time. Then I replied to them, there's nothing to these rumors you're spreading. You're inventing them in your own mind. And then he went back to work. Now, he didn't respond and didn't spend a lot of time with this because, first of all, he knew that those things were wrong. He knew that they were lies. And secondly, he knew that it was a waste of time for him to try and go get all that stuff back or to refute those accusations. He simply went back to work. And then he prayed, Lord, strengthen me. Listen, folks. If you've ever been the brunt of gossip, if you've ever been maligned as far as your character is concerned, that's a painful thing to experience. But let me encourage you and realize that you need to look at it the way Nehemiah did. There's only one person's opinion that matters about you, and that's God's. Nehemiah said, so Lord, strengthen me. In other words, Lord, don't let me get my sense of self-worth out of what people think. Let me get my sense of self-worth only because of what you think. Now, they also tried to turn up the heat on uh, Nehemiah by using intimidation. Look at verses 10 through 14. I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mahatabel, who was restricted to his house. He said, let us meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let us shut the temple doors because they are coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can I enter the temple and live? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated, do as he suggested, sin, and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they have done, and also Noadiah the prophetess and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. Now, we're not given a lot of information here, but somehow or another, uh, Nehemiah is at Shemaiah's house. We don't know if he called for Nehemiah, if, if he just went to go visit him, but there he is, and Shemaiah, and most likely Shemaiah is a priest. Shemaiah says, you know, I've learned of a plot to kill you, so let's go and hide in the temple. Now, why do we think he was a priest? Because only a priest would have access to the temple. Does that make sense? So most likely he was a priest, and he says to Nehemiah, there's a threat on your life, but if we go hide in the temple, you'll be safe. Now that seems innocent enough, and it seems perhaps a good course of action, but it was really designed to discredit Nehemiah in at least three ways. First of all, it was designed to, to discredit his leadership. You heard what Nehemiah said, verse 11, should a man like me run away? Now he wasn't so much talking about himself personally, but he was saying, hey, I'm the governor here. You know, I, I have a position of leadership. Should a position of le person in a position of leadership run away from a problem? No, you don't run away from a problem. You deal with the problem. But he was being offered this opportunity by Shemaiah as a way to show that he would be a weak leader and run away from this problem. It was also designed to, to discredit him uh, with regards to his character. What Shemaiah was suggesting here, that they hide in the temple, was a violation of God's law. Plain and simple, black and white. Listen to Numbers, the 18th chapter, verse 7. Now this is God speaking to Aaron, and you know that Aaron back then, that was who the original priest was going to be. And this is what God said to Aaron in, verses, in verse 7 of, of Numbers 18. But only you and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I'm giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Now listen to this. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary must be put to death. Did you hear that? Anyone else who went into the temple sanctuary area, they were to be killed because they weren't allowed in there. 
But Shemaiah was suggesting that that's where Nehemiah go to hide. This is a direct violation of what God said should be done. Don't you know that Nehemiah's reputation would have suffered if he had openly violated God's law in front of the people? But finally, it was designed to discredit his reputation. The priests back in that day and time were highly respected by the Jews, and for Nehemiah to go against something that the priest recommended him to do had the opportunity or the potential to give Nehemiah a bad reputation. All of this was designed to discredit Nehemiah. But Nehemiah saw through this. Obviously, a priest who recommends a sinful solution to a problem is not speaking the truth. Amen or oh me? So Nehemiah saw that straight away and said, How could a priest who has my best interest at heart and wants to glorify God recommend a sinful solution to a problem? So he saw through it, saw that it was a way just to intimidate him. Now, folks, you know as well as I do that intimidation can come in all kinds of different ways and forms. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're trying to follow Jesus, then there are going to be people who are going to come along and try and intimidate you to keep you from doing that. The thing for you to do is do just like Nehemiah did and say, nope, not going to let that intimidation deter me from what God has asked me to do. But also, and let's just talk about the human nature side of this for a moment, When people threaten us, when they try and intimidate us, our knee-jerk human reaction is to threaten them and intimidate them, isn't it? I mean, you're going to kick me in the knee, I'll kick you in both knees, right? I mean, that's just the kind of way we're wired. But did you hear what Nehemiah did? When Nehemiah came face-to-face with this intimidation, he didn't seek revenge. He didn't say, Lord, this is what I'm going to do to these folks. What did he say there in verse 14? My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they've done. And also Noadiah the prophetess, and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. He kept doing what God asked him to do, and then he said, Lord, I'm going to let you deal with these people. Folks, if you face intimidation in trying to serve Christ, take that same approach. Keep doing what God has asked you to do, and if it's rooted in people, say, Lord, I'm just surrendering those folks over to you. Lord, you deal with them, but let me continue to be faithful to what you've called me to do. There was one final way that they turned up the heat on Nehemiah, and it was through betrayal. Look at verses 15 through 19. The wall was completed in 52 days in the 25th day of the month Elul. Then when all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. During those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. Now listen to this. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him since he was a son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Arah, and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. In other words, Tobiah was related to these folks in Jerusalem through marriage. All right, verse 19. These nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So you see what was happening there. People on the inside of Jerusalem, they they were related to Tobiah, who's on the outside, who's not a Jew, yet they were taking information about Nehemiah, forwarding it to Tobiah, and Tobiah was using that inside information to write threatening letters to Nehemiah. And in the course of that, these nobles, these people on the inside of Jerusalem, kept saying to Nehemiah, you know that Tobiah, he's a pretty good fella. I mean, you can trust him. All ways in which they were trying to halt the work of the wall, and it's rooted in this idea of betrayal. Folks, you know, betrayal can be a painful thing. If you've ever been betrayed, you know what I'm talking about. Folks, I want to confess to you this morning that I've come to the realization here recently that one of my very best friends has been betraying me for a long time. Who am I talking about? My body. You know, me and my body have been best friends for a long time. I mean, I've counted on my body for a lot of things. When I was in the first grade, I was the fastest kid in my class. I mean, I could run faster than anybody. And when I was a teenager, I could play basketball for hours. I would never think of taking an ibuprofen or anything like that. And here lately, I mean, even last night, uh, Terry and I were were out. We were at a restaurant, and I had to tell, I I had to say, honey, how much is the check here? Because I couldn't read it well enough. I didn't have my glasses with me. And this has been a slow, gradual betrayal for a long period of time. And you know what I'm afraid of? It's going to (laughs) continue. 
Well, I'm afraid that there's going to come a time where arthritis is going to get in my hand and I'm not going to be able to play the guitar. On a more serious note, folks, you know, when we think about the fact that our bodies really, truly, even though they're our best friend, there's the potential for them to betray us. That can get kind of depressing. But I've come to realize that I need to look at it a little bit differently. God has said to me, you know, Robbie, it's not so much that your body is betraying you as much as it is. And this is God speaking. God's saying, Robbie, I'm just I'm just taking all the things out of you that's weak and that's not suited for heaven. Because there's coming a time when you're going to be with me in heaven and you need to have the kind of body that's suited for all of eternity. So all I'm doing is just weeding out all that bad stuff. So when the time comes, you can spend eternity with me. Now, folks, that may be taking lemons and trying to make lemonade, but it's really true. And the reason I say that is because for Nehemiah, when he came face to face with the fact that he was being betrayed by the very people he was trying to help, instead of focusing on the betrayal, look at what he focused on. Look at the end of verse 16. He said, this task had been accomplished by our God. Instead of focusing on the betrayal, in the midst of the painful circumstances that it created in him, he didn't focus on the betrayal. He focused on on the accomplishments of God, what God had accomplished. He could have taken credit for the wall. He could have given credit to the people. But he said, no, we know that this was God who did this. Listen, betrayal, folks, seriously, by a friend, someone that's close to you, that can be painful. And it can happen for you as a believer as you are trying to serve God. But make no mistake, as painful as that can be, not even that should deter us from recognizing and acknowledging the mighty hand of God at work in us. Folks, there's some comfort and some solace in recognizing that in spite of what people may do to us, God is working towards our best interests because he loves us. It's no doubt. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to experience opposition as you try to build the kingdom and live a life faithful to him. But let us not be discouraged by that. Let us recognize that no matter what opposition we face, our God is greater than it is. There was a young man who decided to go for a walk on a warm Saturday morning, and there was a park nearby with some recreation facilities. He decided he would walk that way. And lo and behold, that Saturday morning, the t-ball leagues were in uh, play. Have you ever seen a t-ball game? And the the stands were filled with parents watching their kids play t-ball. And he stood there and watched that for a little bit, and then he was close enough to the stands. He asked one of the parents, he said, uh, said, what's the score? And uh, that fella said, well, it's 18 to nothing. And uh, the young man said, wow. He said, well, who's winning? And the parent said, well, the other team's winning. The young man said, wow, your kids really must be discouraged. And the parent said, oh, no, it's only the first inning, and we haven't batted yet. (laughs) If you've ever watched a t-ball game, you know what they're talking about. It can be a high-scoring affair. But truly, folks, In spite of how great the opposition we face, our God is greater. No matter what obstacles Satan may throw in our way, he's a defeated enemy. And the truth of the matter is, is that God will provide ways in which we can follow him. He will equip his saints if we will simply say yes to him and say no to anything that hinders the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, this is an opportunity for you this evening, or this morning to do business with God. Now, folks, just as a reminder, chapter 6 told us that the wall was finished in 52 days. And it was because God was working in the lives of those people. Now it's the same God who wants to do a great work in you who did a great work in them. What God is waiting for is for us to say no to anything that hinders the building of his kingdom and say yes to him. That's all he's waiting for. 
Now, some of you are here this morning, and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You've never made that decision. And we want to encourage you to do that today because we know that through that decision to confess sin and through that decision to surrender your life to Christ, not only do you receive the gift of eternal life and begin a relationship with God, but you begin living life the way it was designed to be in a rich, intimate relationship with your Creator. We want to encourage you this morning to say no to whatever obstacles are in the way of that decision and say yes to Christ. Now, many of us here are already believers in Christ, but it's very possible that we've become discouraged through the efforts of the enemy. Perhaps we've compromised our convictions. Maybe we have allowed intimidation or gossip to deter us from God's plan for our lives. Perhaps even the heartache of betrayal has led us to a place where we've simply opted out of the game. If you're here this morning as a believer and you recognize that that is an apt description of you, we're encouraging you this morning to come to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and confess sin and say, Lord, I've allowed things to get me off track, but Lord, I want to be back on track. I want to be in the center of your will. I want to know you intimately and know you to the degree where each and every day I'm sensing your leadership. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to Christ today. During the invitation, we're encouraging you to come forward. If not for those reasons, perhaps because God has said to you, this is the church that you need to be a part of and you want to join this church. Maybe you need to come to this altar and pray and just ask God for strength and courage, just like Nehemiah did to live a life that is pleasing and obedient to Christ. Won't you respond to him this morning? Now, Holy Spirit, we know that you love us. We know that this invitation to us today is possible and made possible only by your grace and your mercy towards us. We do not warrant or deserve second and third and fourth chances. It's only because you love us and want us to be in close relationship with you that we have these opportunities. So, Holy Spirit, draw us close to your side today. Forgive us, Lord, where we failed. Restore our relationship with you, and we ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen.